that which was from the beginning, which we've heard, which we've seen with our eyes, which we've looked upon, our hands have handled of the word of life. For the life was manifested, and we've seen it, and bear witness, and show unto you that eternal life, which was with the Father, and was manifested unto us. That which we've seen and heard declare we unto you, that ye also may have fellowship with us. And truly, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And these things write we unto you, that your joy may be full. This then is the message which we've heard of him, and declare unto you that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanseth us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. My little children, these things write I unto you that you sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he is the propitiation for our sins, not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. And hereby we do know that we know him if we keep his commandments. He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoso keepeth his word, in him verily is the love of God perfected. Hereby know we that we're in him. He that saith he abideth in him, ought himself also so to walk, even as he walked. Brethren, I write no new commandment unto you, but an old commandment, which ye had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which you've heard from the beginning. Again, a new commandment I write unto you, which thing is true in him and in you, because the darkness is past, and the true light now shineth. He that saith he is in the light, and hateth his brother, is in darkness even until now. He that loveth his brother abideth in the light, and there is none occasion of stumbling in him. But but he that hateth his brother is in darkness, and walketh in darkness, and knoweth not whither he goeth, because that darkness hath blinded his eyes. I write unto you, little children, because your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake. I write unto you, fathers, because ye've known him that is from the beginning. I write unto you, young men, because ye've overcome the wicked one. I write unto you, little children, because ye've known the Father. I've written unto you, fathers, because ye've known him that is from the beginning. I've written unto you, young men, because ye're strong, and the word of God abideth in you, and you've overcome the wicked one. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Little children, it is the last time. And as ye've heard, that Antichrist shall come. Even now are there many Antichrists, whereby we know that it is the last time. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest that they were not all of us. But ye have an unction from the Holy One, and ye know all things. I have not written unto you because ye know not the truth, but because ye know it, and that no lie is of the truth. Who is a liar but he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ? He is Antichrist that denieth the Father and the Son. Whosoever denieth the Son, the same hath not the Father. But he that acknowledge the Son, hath the Father also. Let that therefore abide in you which you have heard from the beginning. If that which you have heard from the beginning shall remain in you, ye also shall continue in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise that he hath promised us, even eternal life. These things have I written unto you concerning them that seduce you. But the anointing which ye have received of him abideth in you, and ye need not that any man teach you. But as the same anointing teacheth you of all things, and is true, and is no life, and even as it hath taught you, ye shall abide in him. And now, little children, abide in him, that when he shall appear, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. If ye know that he is righteous, ye know that every one that doeth righteousness is born of him.
Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. And ye know that he was manifest to take away our sins, and in him is no sin. Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. Whosoever sinneth hath not seen him, neither known him. Little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. He that committed sin is of the devil, for the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him. And he cannot sin, because he is born of God. In this the children of God are manifest, and the children of the devil. Whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of God, neither he that loveth not his brother. For this is the message that ye heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. Not as Cain, who was of that wicked one, slew his brother. And wherefore slew he him? Because his own works were evil, and his brother's righteous. Marvel not, my brethren, if the world hate you. We know that we've passed from death unto life, because we love the brethren. He that loveth not his brother abideth in death. Whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer. And ye know that no murderer hath he eternal life abiding in him. Hereby perceive we the love of God, because he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But whoso hath this world's good, and seeth his brother have need, and shutteth up his bowels of compassion from him, how dwelleth the love of God in him? My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. And hereby we know that we are of the truth, and shall assure our hearts before him. For if our heart condemn us, God is greater than our heart, and knoweth all things. Beloved, if our heart condemn us not, then have we confidence toward God. And whatsoever we ask, we receive of him, because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. And this is his commandment, that we should believe on the name of his Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as he gave us commandment. And he that keepeth his commandments dwelleth in him, and he in him. And hereby we know that he abideth in us by the Spirit which he hath given us. Lord, make my life today a life of prayer that I may intercede for souls everywhere. Lord, give me a burden today for the lost on life's perilous sea. Help me guide them safely to Thee. Lord, help me, I pray. One sat alone beside the highway begging his eyes were blind, the light he could not see. He clutched his old rags and shivered in the shadows. Then Jesus came and bade his darkness flee. It's time to open the word once again with evangelist Lester Roloff on the Family Altar Program. For all is changed when Jesus comes to stay. Turn your Bible with me, please, to Proverbs chapter 28 for our first verse. Proverbs 28. Faith comes by hearing. It's a sad thing when people go to church and can't hear. But it's a sadder thing when people don't want to hear. And I had in mind to speak on a chapter, and I will tonight, but this at least will be the introduction to the New Testament text. So if you'll turn in the book of Proverbs, chapter 28. 
And I'll just give you the one, two verses, I believe, that I'd like to share with you. Verse 13, he that covereth his sins shall not prosper. And yet I'd be the first to say that everybody needs his sins covered. But the emphasis, the wise man, uh, the Holy Spirit, is that man, when he seeks to cover his sins, cannot prosper. The devil has introduced from the fig leaf aprons down to religious clothes and denominational loyalty and good works and improvement programs and be good and do good and be nice and do better. All of that is a useless effort of man to cover his own sins. And any man that tries to cover his own sins without the finished work of Christ on the cross will never prosper. And so he said, he that covereth his sins shall not prosper. But whoso confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. That's one of the greatest texts in the Bible. The latter part of that verse is the key. It's the answer. There are not many preachers that ever last much longer after the success comes. I'll pray for you. I want you to really have a great ministry, win many souls to Christ, and uh, steer clear as much as possible of wood and stubble because that's going to go in the fire. But stay with the gold, silver, and precious stone. And may the Lord bless your ministry and bless your heart. And your ministry will never rise any higher than you rise. Never will. You might have an inflated ministry for a while, but unless it's built on the rock and the Word of God and literally saturated with the Holy Spirit, It'll never last. He that covereth his sins shall not prosper, but whoso confesseth, and that's not all of it. We're living in a time of many confessions. We've got more confessions than we've ever had before. Church members are doing more confession today. Nothing to hear church members said, I'm no good. <laughs> and it's an honest confession. Most of them are not. But I mean, that's just a lot of talk. That's just a bunch of blowhard. You know, I'm so sorry I, I don't win souls like I used to, and I don't pray like I used to, and I don't love the Word of God like I used to, and I'm not separated like I used to be, and I'm not consecrated like I, and I've let sin come in my life, and my home's not happy like just confessing. Not worth the snap of your finger. And I don't know of anybody's bigger confessors uh, than Baptists unless it could be the Catholics. They probably do a good deal of confessing. Got a lot of confessing going on today. That's not the answer. That's not going to get you anywhere. You say, don't you believe in confessing? Yes. If you go ahead and finish out this verse. I believe confessing can become a part of your hypocrisy. I believe confessing can become a salve for your soul. I just like some people pray. They don't pray to get their prayer answered. They pray to save over their soul. I've heard people say, uh, Brother Roth, I want you to know I pray every day. Pray every day. Remember I went to, in a home one day during World War Number 2 in Houston, Texas on Harrisburg Boulevard. And a lady sat in a room. She had a cigarette in the left hand and a bottle of beer in the right hand. And she said, I want you to know that I pray every day for my boy in the service. Well, I said, sister, you're wasting your time. And she swelled up, got mad. She said, what do you mean? Well, I said, anybody that's got a cigarette in one hand, a bottle of beer in the other hand, no need you asking God, because if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear. He's not going to fool with you. And if your boy ever gets back alive, you come back in spite of his worldly mama. And that's the truth. The average Baptist is no on prayer ground and can't get his prayers answered. But he does a lot of confessing. You know a part, and I just say this, I know I'm on the radio uh, with all of our friends, and yet it ought to be said, did you know 
that the psychiatrist has sort of become an earthly priest. You know what you're supposed to do when you go to a psychiatrist? Confess everything you've done. That's right, he'll ask you, you know, he'll just say, now, you, you just, you, you lay on the couch, they call it the couch, and the, the uh, he comes in, psychologist or psychiatrist, he comes in, and uh, he, he'll listen to you, but remember one thing, he's getting a dollar a minute for everything you confess, so you better confess in a hurry. And if you have 30 minutes, he'll charge you $30. Now you'd say, but Brother Olaf, don't you believe there's any Christians that psychiatrist? I know of one. I know of one. And he came from Orlando. That's right. Old Jim. He, he was, he's, I haven't seen him in a long time, but um, he was in the service here. And uh, I believe was a doctor, but he decided, and he started writing Bible prescriptions right here in Orlando. Women come to him. A lot of the officers' wives had come, you know, all uh, shook up and nervous and neurotic and full of cigarettes and liquor and beer and wine and filth and a dirty conscience. And he'd uh, write them out a prescription like Isaiah 26, 3. He said, go home and take that for a week. <laughs> right? Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee because he trusteth in thee. <laughs> You know, old Jim said uh, uh, they'd come back. He'd give them a bunch of scripture, just write down on a prescription pad. He said, "Here, take this." I mean, uh, just uh, it, it, this prescription's already filled in the Bible. Just go to the Bible and find it. See, and they'd come back and said, uh, "I'm feeling better." Wouldn't it be a sight, preacher, if we just get our people to practice the Word of God? I mean, wouldn't it be a new day if, if people, well, you, wouldn't, you couldn't seat the people in this auditorium. If we started giving the people what they need and they begin to live by it, why, well, you, listen, they'd fill a cow pasture. I mean, they'd absolutely come from everywhere. Well, why? Because they'd get something to live by. Man can't live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. I believe this book, you can live by it. I believe that everything you need is found in the Word of God. The Bible said no good thing will he withhold from them who walk uprightly. The Bible said every good and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, in whom there's no variable, neither shadow of turning. The Bible said God is faithful in that he'll not let you uh, suffer you to be tempted above that you're able, but will with the temptation make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. The Bible said seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and a double L. All these things shall be added unto you. The Bible said, My God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Wouldn't it be someday if people got to where they believe that? Of course, it'd bust the drugstore. It'd bankrupt the hospital. You say, Do you mean that? I guess I do mean it. I mean, if, if, if I can go 20 years as sick as I was, without buying any drugs, aspirin tablets and Anderson tablets and all the rest of the junk you carry in your purse and, pick and pocket. You said, Brother Olaf, why don't you stick with the Bible? I'm right in the middle of it now. You let me alone. I'll do the preaching in there. You do the listening. <laughs> A lot of people don't even know when you're preaching the Bible. I'm just, I, I quoted the verse that said, my God will supply a double L. What does that mean? That's all of them. He said he'd, if, if we'd put him first, and seek him first, all these things would be added. If we believe that, why don't we get after it then? Ah, oh, listen, dear friends. We've gotten off into modernism, and modernism is refusing to trust Christ for our provisions. That's modernism. And that's where the old church is today. And that's where the people are today. And that's why the world quit going to church. Ah, oh, hear me. He said... If you'll confess, now then, the second part of the verse before I come to that chapter. He that confesseth and forsaketh, that is. Let me ask you a question. Will you forsake what came between you and Christ? Will you forsake what came between you and the Bible? Will you forsake what came between you and your prayer life? Will you forsake tonight what came between you and your soul winning life? Will you do it? You'd say, no, sir. Then you'll never, you'll never be blessed. 
Now the Bible said, he that confesseth and forsaketh them shall what? Get mercy from the Lord. Mercy from the Lord. That's why right, you get his mercy. And so we do not need just confessing. We need forsaking of sin. We'll never have revival. I'm often reminded of the remark that evangelist Billy Graham made when he said, I've never seen revival. I've never seen revival. In all of my traveling around the world, he said, I've never seen a revival Charles G. Finney saw, Jonathan Edwards saw. I've never seen the kind of revival George Whitfield saw. I've never seen real, that's what he said. Why? Oh, there's a lot of questions raised today, and people are always asking me this question. Brother Roloff, do you believe we'll have worldwide revival and great surge of revival before Jesus comes? May I ask you one question? Where's it coming from? Where's it coming from? Why, we haven't got enough spirituality left in this nation to hatch out a revival. We, listen, our temperature's it, it, too low to hatch out revival eggs. Why, evangelism is practically over. Now, you can have a revival in your church, thank God for that. And I believe that a revival ought to be a local thing. I believe it ought to be right here in the middle of your church. I believe Brother Ware can have a revival. I believe that Brother Everybody Else can have a revival. If he'll go in there and stick with the Word of God and let the Holy Spirit breathe upon him and his people, I believe God will give revival. Not tell you what will happen. When you have real revival, you're going to have a soul winning campaign going on. Don't you kid yourself. You let this bunch of old moss back church members get right with God, they'll start winning souls. Don't kid yourself. I know what I'm talking about. You let a man get back up to concert pitch and get his heart hurting and tears start rolling again and he gets concerned about souls. He'll be winning the people to Christ. He'll be winning people to Christ. He said, I made all things. Paul said, I made all things to all men that I might by all means save some. Yes, dear friends, Jesus will save people when they get concerned. I mean, when Christians get concerned. And I want to say something else. Lost people will never be more concerned about their soul than Christians are for them. Never will be. Now then, I want you to turn with me to 1 John. 1 John, the first chapter. 1 John, chapter 1. 1 John chapter 1. There are 10 verses in this chapter. And there's um, two or three words I won't emphasize in the message tonight. Now you pray earnestly. I know that it's trying to storm outside, but uh, we're safe in here. I'd rather be here than anywhere else I know when the storms are raging. Now then, verse 1, that which was from the beginning, which we've heard, which we've seen with our eyes, which we've looked upon, and our hands have handled of the word of life. For the life was manifested, and we've seen it, and bear witness, and show unto you that eternal life which was with the Father, and was manifested unto us. That which we've seen and heard declare we unto you, that ye also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. One of the first things I want to say, real fellowship has to be with the Father and with the Son. Now, you can shake hands, you can have church dinners, you can have church socials, we can have visitation, but real fellowship must be with the Father and with his Son. And these things write we unto you, that your joy may be full. Did you ever really get the extent of that verse? He said, we have written these things unto you, that your joy may be full. Do you have a full joy? I mean, is your joy bucket full? Is it really full tonight? I mean, are you really happy? Do you sing during the day? Do you praise the Lord during the day? Do you have a time of praise like you have a time of prayer? I mean, I'm talking to you about something that's sensible to me, and I've said it many times. 
Prayer is the lubrication system of the soul. I mean, praise is. Prayer uh, is good and wonderful and must be. But dear friends, when you get the victory in prayer, I believe you ought to praise the Lord a while. I've never known of an unhappy Christian to be an effective Christian. You have neither. Strange as it may seem, we're living in a time when people come home from doing their church work and take sleeping pills to go to sleep. Evangelists, if you please, will go into the pulpit and preach and sweat will run down and they'll uh, give out a message and yet they'll have to take tranquilizers to go to sleep. To me, that's inconsistent with the gospel. You'd say, well, Brother Olaf, no Brother Olaf to it. I just believe that we ought to come to the place where we can trust God. And I believe the preacher and the Christian worker ought to trust God for all of his needs. We got too much unhappiness in our churches today. Not enough joy. I enjoyed the choir a while ago. That's great. That's great. Every good church needs a good choir. You need a lot of good singing. Need the right kind of musicians. Need consecrated musicians. Separated, dedicated. Pianist ought to be just as dedicated as a preacher. Organist ought to be just as clean and upright as the preacher, the choir, every one of them, ought to be just as separated from the world as the man who stands to preach the Word of God. You know, the, as I grow older in the ministry, I look back at some of the things that um, the Lord gave me courage to do, and this, this has been that way all my life. I mean, when God called me to preach, the first thing He did was get me straightened out my convictions. And I praise Him for it. I really do. And if a preacher got up and preached something and... Uh, it was the truth. I just believed it, and I said, I'm going to practice it. I really did. I'd go home, and I'd tell Mama about it. I said, Mama, I'm not going to do that no more. I heard the preacher say it wasn't right, and I'm not going to do it no more. And some of my family, you know, they said, well, it looks to me like you've gone off the deep end. But I tell you one thing, when God gives you a conviction and you won't practice it, that's your last conviction he'll give you. If you don't walk in the light God gives you, you watch and see that light will become darkness, and our great shall become that dark. You better stay with whatever God gives you. Pastor in a little old church in Trinidad. Had a wonderful time. And I've never pastored a church in my life that I didn't have the greatest time in the world. I never have been pastor of any church in my life. But while I tell you the truth, it, I bawled every time I resigned and went somewhere else. And, and the people did. And I loved them, hated to leave. And only God pushed me out. I've loved every church I've ever pastored. I'm pastor in little old churches. I'm telling you, you could get them in a matchbox almost. But I loved them. I loved them. Oh, I loved every church, and I thought it was such an honor to be the pastor of a church. And I've never lost uh, somewhat of a desire uh, to pastor people and baptize converts and win people and consistently stay with people on the field, keep one or two or three hundred people on my heart all the time to win to Christ. I mean, to know people on every street in town almost where I could go and visit and talk to them about the Lord Jesus Christ. There's something mighty challenging, brother, where about pastoring a church. God calls some to be pastors and some evangelists. And now then I'm in the evangelism field. But oh, I, I covet the best for our pastors and for the churches. But I remember I had a church in Trinidad and we had uh, one family that had to break home. And uh, it is nice. Only brick home, I guess, in town, just about it. And, and the lady there uh, was our pianist. And um, she had the only baby grand piano in town. And she was, a, uh, was, she was a good musician. She'd been given a lot of music. And she was playing the piano. But she wasn't faithful. She wasn't loyal. She wasn't consecrated. I mean, just tell the truth. I mean, she just plain sorry. And, of course, I, I was just getting started in the ministry. And, I mean, but God gave me some conviction that the pianist ought to be dedicated. And I started out trying to sing in my early part of the ministry. And so I went up one day to practice a song. And, and I tell you, if you folks knew how hard it was for me to learn a song, you'd appreciate my singing more. <laughs> hey, a lot of these people, you know, they just learn a song like that. Read me. I never could read music. Man, I just have to hear somebody sing it and get after it, and maybe I'll put my own tune to it or something. But anyhow, uh, I went up there, and I was practicing, and she came in, and I smelled cigarettes. Well, that just uh, knocked the tune out of me. <laughs> I thought, my. And I looked at her. I could call her name, but I won't. I looked at her, and I said, I didn't know you smoked. Oh, yes, she said. I smoked for some time, a number of years. 
Well, I said, you know, it's not right. And I said, you know, it's, you're going to have to make a decision between the pack of cigarettes and the piano down at the church house. She braced herself, sort of one of these sisters Sputendike came, you know. I mean, had a lot of culture, a lot of refinement, didn't have much righteousness. She looked at me and she said, well, who will you get to play the piano? And I was just a little old ignorant country boy, and I was just getting started. First, uh, about the first full-time church I ever had. I stood up real straight, just like a little fast dog with his hair sticking up. Well, I said, uh, we'll chop every note out of that pen and pitch it out the window one at a time before we'll let somebody smoke cigarettes play it. Now, that sounded awful rude, didn't it? But, I mean, that was when, when God first started me off in the ministry. My daddy smoked. My father-in-law smoked. Many people smoked. And yet, God gave me some conviction. I said, I'll stay with it. Amen. And I preached to my daddy for 30 years before he ever gave up his cigarettes. I preached to my father-in-law for the same amount of time before he ever gave up his cigars and pipe smoking and all that. Yet, God finally dug into them, just dug into them because we kept hammering away. And preacher and people, I believe when God gives you a conviction, you ought to stay with it. We lost her. She went her worldly way. Her home shattered. Her life shattered. And the next Sunday morning, the Lord sent a precious lady to play the piano. One of the finest going to be with the Lord. Now, listen, God will supply your needs but we better stay with the truth. So he said, these things write we unto you that your joy may be full. I believe the pianist ought to be full of joy and the organist and, and the choir and the members of the church and the pastor ought to be full of joy. I read the other day where the statement was made that hardly ever do you find a happy person with cancer. Now, I don't think that that's altogether true. And a doctor came out the other day and made a great statement, which I believe is right, when he said the only way to cure cancer is starve it to death. You've got to feed it or she'll die. But you see, we've gotten so far away from the Bible fasting, see? The Bible said this kind goeth not out but by prayer and fasting. We've gotten away from some of the doctrines of the Bible, such as prayer and praise and fasting and, and, and the tremendous things that they used to do when God's power was upon them. John Wesley. George Whitfield and Jonathan Edwards and great old preachers of the past used to fast and pray and wait upon the Lord. Loved ones would get burdened for their children, wouldn't eat a bite. But you notice, and I've watched this thing, and I'm not, uh, I'm not getting off the subject. I'm showing you, though, that there are two times when people eat the most, and they ought not to. One of them is during revival. Have you ever noticed what people do to the preacher in a revival? They feed him till he can't hardly waddle up the pulpit. <laughs> Preachers tell me everywhere, of course, I, I don't do, do it anymore. Many years ago, I made up my mind. I made up my mind. I said, no, sir, draw the line. I'm going to preach a revival, and if you book me up for two or three meals a day, what if the Lord told me to fast? Why, the dear sisters get mad and swell up. Said, he didn't even come to eat with me. That's just the reason I don't even start out to eat with you. I come through town when I'm not preaching, and I'll be glad to eat with you, but I tell you, brother, when a revival comes to place, I mean, just need to be ready. God's people need to be taught to fast and pray if you want the power of God upon the services. Say what you please, dear friends. It's in the book. And then the other time, when we usually feast real heavy, it's on the Lord's Day, isn't it? It's on the Lord's Day. That's the time when we have the big spreads, and that's the time they nearly killed me when I went to my little church and I'd, I'd feast instead of fast. But I'm showing you something. He said, we're, we're to be filled with joy, that your joy may be full. Where'd it come from? By what he wrote. These things write we unto you. That's the word of God. I've never known of a happy Christian that wasn't a Bible Christian. I've never known of a person that you could make consistently to serve the Lord unless he got in the word of God and stayed with it. And brother pastor, I guess I'll never be pastor again, uh, so far as I know. But I know one thing. If I were to ever pastor again, there wouldn't be but one thing I'd try to do. And it's give my people to read the Bible, read the Bible, read the Bible, stay with the Bible, memorize the Bible, read it in the home, read it in the church, and I'd read it to them. I'd read it to them. I'd go in the church, and we'd have 30 minutes of nothing but Bible reading. 
and I'd read it. Have everybody with the Bible? You know what the Bible says? Blessed is he that read it, readeth, and blessed is the man that listens or hears it read. Your blessing and your joy is going to come from the Word of God. Well, let me hasten on to the text. This then is the message, this then is the message, which we've heard of him, declare unto you that God is light. What is the message? God is light. The gospel is the light, and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him, walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light, the entrance of thy word giveth light. There it is. Would you admit with me tonight that America is darker than she's ever been before? Would you admit with me tonight that this old world is in the heaviest, thickest darkness she's ever been? Do you believe that this is the end time darkness? I do. I believe that the darkness of sin has finally settled upon the world and the light will never come till Jesus comes. Now we'll have a few little matches struck here and there and a few little flashlights, gospel flashlights, and that'll be wonderful. But dear friend, if we walk in darkness, if we walk in darkness, but he said if we walk in the light, and that's the word of God. I'm talking to you about the Bible tonight. If we walk in the Bible, we're going to have fellowship. I don't care. Now, and, and you know one of the convictions the Lord's given me the last few years, and that is the worldliness of the newspaper. I know I'm hitting some things that might be pretty close at you, but I'll guarantee you our church members that read the newspaper more than they do the Bible, I believe they're a bunch of worldly church members. Jump up in the morning and grab an old world. And you, you know what's in the newspaper, don't you? It's the worldly junk. And when you're reading the newspaper, you're reading one of the worldliest things in town. And yet you sit there on, and you start with the front page and you read almost to the back page. And when you get through, you've spent 30 minutes, 45 minutes, you've spent an hour, and then I tell you what you do. You log your Bible reading time and log your other reading time, see what you do. If you want to know what kind of Christian you are tonight, and I've never said this just like this, but I'm going to say it tonight. If you log your newspaper and magazine reading and your television watching, and then right down under that put your Bible reading, I'll guarantee you I'll, I'll make a cardiograph of your heart. I, I'll get, I can announce to the world just what kind of Christian you are. And I can tell you exactly when you bring your log to me on Monday morning exactly what kind of Christian you've been the last seven days. I can tell you whether you won souls or not, whether you get your prayers answered, whether you're happy or not, whether you got a happy home or not. I can tell you if you log your time and let me see how you start your day out. If you grab a cup of coffee and a newspaper and sit there for an hour and let the Bible go begging, brother, you're mixed up in worldliness. Oh, I know we talk a lot about worldliness. Sometimes we get that to do idea, you know, well, I haven't killed anybody. You'd be surprised to know how many people you have killed. You won't know how many people you've killed till you stand before Jesus. Oh, when you hear the neighbor cry, and when you see him pass out in the darkness of night forever, saying, I live next door to you. I heard you fuss as loud as I fuss. Oh, I know you went to church on Sunday morning, but your life wasn't any better than mine. I heard some of your wild parties over there on Saturday night, and I saw you stagger out to church the next day, but... You wait. You don't have any people you have killed. You watch the same dirty television show, the late show and all that filth and murder and bloodshed in the living room that I watched. No wonder you didn't win me to cry. You wait. You don't have any people you have killed. You'll have more blood dripping from your fingers than you think you'll have when you stand before God. I know this is a serious thought, but brother, we might as well face it. The average church member wouldn't know worldliness if he saw it walking down the middle of the road. What is worldliness? It's not just adultery. It's not stealing or cigarette smoking or liquor drinking. Worldliness is getting in love with anything in the world. It can be an old boat and a motor. It can be a camper that will take you out to one of these little silly lakes for Saturday night and Sunday and Sunday night. It can be two cars, two automobiles when you couldn't even pay for the one. That could be worldliness. It could be a sack of bowling balls. It could be a little white golf ball and a sack of clubs beating it out across the cow pasture somewhere. <laughs> oh, you'd say, Brother Olaf, I've just got to have recreation. Well, sure, get up and down on your knees and take a good long walk around the block and tell everybody about Jesus and come back home and go to sleep. 
I'm sick of a lot of this junk they call recreation. Let God's people get a divorce from the world, and then the world's coming back to see what's going on. You watch and see. For walk in the light as he is in the light. We have fellowship one with another. And notice the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. I like that. That's one of the greatest verses in the Bible. Oh, you say, what does that mean to you, Brother Olaf? It just means exactly what it says, that Jesus Christ and his blood cleanses from all sin. That didn't leave any for the tabernacle to cleanse. That didn't leave any for the water up in your beautiful baptistry. And that didn't leave any for the priest. And that didn't leave any for the Virgin Mary. And that didn't leave any for Brother Olaf or Brother anybody else. It just means exactly what it says, that the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses from all sin. You want to get your sin cleansed, go to Jesus, and you can just stop right there. There's no religious cleansing. There's no church cleansing. Brother, it's just Jesus. But let's hasten on, because we want to finish this chapter. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. And the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins. Now, this is the verse that's been on my heart since last night. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just. You know, a lot of times we talk about the Lord being faithful. But, brother, he's not only faithful, he's just. The justice of God. You know, the old-time preachers used to really preach an hour, two hours on the justice of God. Oh, brother, fire jump out of both eyeballs. And I'll guarantee you they'd make everybody know that God was just, faithful and just. You watch, you read through the Bible and preach on the justice of God and watch them how they got it. I enjoy reading at least once a year and climbing the gallows and watching old Haman fall. Why? Justice of God. Sorry, rascal. Built a big gallows. Couldn't hardly wait to get Mordecai on them. And yet when that old noose tightened around somebody's neck, it happened to be his own. Look at old Belshazzar. Look at Ahab and old wicked Jezebel. Dogs chewing her up, eating her up. Why? Justice of God. Oh, well, I know a lot of times you think, well, when's the Lord uh, uh, going to take over? He doesn't have to be in any hurry. He doesn't have, he, he, God never gets in a hurry. Only time I've ever read in my life in the Bible where God got in her is when he ran to meet the prodigal son. But I tell you one thing, it won't be long now before it's going to be leveled off. And there's going to be some judgments. And I believe America is entering now into judgment right now. The weather, the violence, the sin, the home, the church, the school, the government, violence, everything you can think about is coming to pass just exactly like the Bible said. I stood on the pier one night this week and reeled in speckled trout after speckled trout, sometimes two at a time. There were two men standing there. They retired. I mentioned this the other day, but they were retired. They're all shook up because they're afraid. They're afraid that somebody's going to come and get what they've saved up before they can spend it up and die. Oh, they're worried and upset. And I tell you, down in my soul, I have a deep-seated deep -seated peace, knowing that what I've got's in the big bank. Now, I'll guarantee you the communists won't ever touch that. And uh, it's up where the moth and the rust and the thieves will never touch. And you better put yours, brother, where the devil can't get a hold of you. What did he say? If we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all, there it is again, cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You know, there are two things that the Bible teaches me. One is that Jesus will wash away every sin of an old stinking sinner. That's number one. The thing that's blessed, though it ought not to be necessary, but it's wonderful, and that is after you get saved by the grace of God, and then, miracle of miracles, you turn your back on God and on the Word of God and become cold and indifferent and drift back into the gems and weeds of sin. Jesus said, I'll come along and I'll wash away every one of your sins. 
Think about it. Church members, Christians, can't you see the wonderful blessing of being a Christian? How in the world can we live in sin when Jesus said, I'll wash every one of them away. I'll cleanse you. This is for the Christian right here. I'll cleanse you from all sin. Yes, he's, he's faithful. He's always been faithful. You know, he was faithful to, to Adam, wasn't he? Have you ever thought about it? God could have just been a little slow, and he said, well, I think, Adam, y'all have pulled a big bone, and you've got in the world and all this trouble now, and everybody's going to be digging cemeteries, lots, and buying them, and digging graves. Now, I think I'll just let you and old sister Eve, y'all had such a good start. I think I'll just let y'all die and sin gets all out of the way, and I'll start with the next generation. No, he didn't. I tell you, the word of God come a-walking in the cool of the day. What is it doing? Looking for a couple old sinners. Faithful. God's faithful. Oh, how faithful God is. Yes, dear friend. He came and said, Adam, where are you? Oh, he sent him over here behind this tree. The little fig leaf clothes won't do, will they? God was faithful. Yes, dear friends. God was faithful to Abraham. God was faithful to old brother Noah. Preached him. Revival campaign lasted 120 years. Think about that. That's the longest revival meeting that's ever lasted and only got eight souls. <laughs> but that is his whole family. Wasn't that sweet? If you boys want to do something, just win your family to the Lord. You men, it wasn't Miss, it wasn't Miss Noah that won him. It's Mr. Noah. He's the preacher. I think she cooked for him. Oh, she might have held a board or two, but I mean, mainly, she was back there in the home and taking care of everything. And I tell you what, he won his wife. He won Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and, and they, he so lived, and they so lived, they won each wife, and there was eight souls that walked into the ark when God gave the invitation. And brother pastor, I challenge you, if you get your men saved and get your men right with God, I believe they'll handle the ladies. Amen. And if you let the men lead out in your church and spend your time winning men to Christ, I tell you, it'll pay off. You'll get whole families when you get the man. Our business is to get them saved. Oh, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just, faithful and just. Stop anywhere you want to in the Bible. Any generation, any history book will prove the faithfulness of God. Let me ask you this. Have you ever learned the secret of God? Have you ever learned the secret of living? It's faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Have you ever really trusted him and been saved and learned to live day by day? just day by day, not be disturbed about any matter at all, just trusting him. I like the old song that sim said simply trusting Jesus. That's all. And that's enough. That's enough. Oh, will you give your heart to him tonight? I heard a sweet story. I know it's true. It took a firm grip on my soul. It told of a Savior who came to save and to make this old broken life whole. His love won my heart. It's a love that will never depart. He took sin away and he came in to stay. His love won my heart. Oh, his love won my heart. It's a love that will never depart. I want to be faithful and loyal and true to the love that won my heart in the last stanza said, and now I'm singing along my way where once I was burdened and sad. Now he is my shepherd, my friend, and my guide, and he makes, and he keeps, and he makes my heart ever glad. Does he make your heart glad? And then does he keep it glad? And he said, are these things that are written unto you that your joy might be full? Thank you for joining us today on the Family Altar Program with Lester Roloff. And they were blessed, he gave the weary rest, he made the blinded eyes to see, he fed the hungry soul, and he made the wounded whole by the waters of Blue Galilee. They sat at his feet. And they looked in his face, content in his presence to be. For no one before had cared for their souls like the stranger who sat by the sea.